felt um, absolutely uh, sort of betrayed, actually. It's betrayed, yeah. Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Today we are joined by Suzanne Moore, one of the most famous columnists from The Guardian newspaper, who sadly recently has decided to leave The Guardian. And she's here to tell us about it and the context of that decision. So Suzanne, hi. Hello. So let's start with your more recent story. Earlier this year, you published an article that people got upset about in The Guardian. There was a letter. What was the circumstances of all of that? Well, it started in March, I guess. Um, but for a long time, I'd been trying to write something on the growing trans, it's called the trans debate, you know, the conflict really between certain feminists and people who are lobbying for trans rights. And that had really come to a head in the previous year because of the Labour Party pledges in the election. Uh, where organisations like Women's Place were deemed hate groups, which was a very, very strong statement. And uh, lots, of, lots of women, I wouldn't describe them in any way as transphobic or anti-trans, but they were simply women getting together saying we have the right to organise and not have our rights um, conflicted, you know. Anyway, so that that row had been bubbling and it had become very, very heated. And it was, it's, it's sort of presented as though there are two sides. And I actually, I don't think there are two sides. I think there's this incredibly strong lobby group that dictates the language in which we can have that debate. And then there's just a whole load of people, men, women, whoever going, hang on a minute, just not quite sure about this. You know, I don't think it's like good pro-trans people and bad anti-trans people. That's to simplify it. But at The Guardian, definitely the line was um, very much what the mantra, you know, trans rights are human rights and trans women are women, trans men are men, non-binary people are non-binary people. All of that's fine. I mean, to which I would answer and women's rights are human rights and children's rights are human rights. And sometimes we just have to negotiate how we deal with all these different rights. That's what we do. But I hadn't been able to write about it because it was a very, very sort of touchy subject. And then in March, I did write about it. And the thing that set me off, I think, that made me really um, upset was that more and more people that I knew, either personally or just knew of, were now being no platformed or having to have a heavy security to teach. So the person I wrote about, Selena Todd, is a professor of modern history at Oxford. She wrote a great book called uh, On the History of the Working Class and another book on Sheila Delaney. She's a very respected person who now has to have security guards to go to teach because she had attended a woman's place meeting. Now, so this then becomes a kind of almost McCarthyite witch hunt. So that's what your column was about. It, that's how it started. And um, the other thing that was happening uh, was that, you know, I'm a feminist, so I'm completely on the side of people being able to express their gender in whatever way they want to, uh, that gender is the social con construct. And that's how things will change. But we started to get from certain parts of trans rights activists, this idea that in fact sex, biological sex was a construct, a spectrum, it didn't exist. And that to me then became a kind of uh, ideology that I could not go along with. So I write the column, which I think is still is quite mild. And the reaction on social media is, I would say, split between Lots and lots of people saying, oh, thank God, thank God you've said it, sort of reaction. And the usual reaction that I've had for years now, die in a ditch turf, you know, you deserve to be raped, I'm going to get you, all of that, because that's what it's like. Um, okay, so that's the reaction. Do they come from people from the left? I mean, do you think it's that the reaction is worse because you're seen to be as someone from the left when you're raising at The Guardian Maybe. and therefore it's more vicious? It's so hard to know where some of it comes from because I've 
never really associated a lot of the abuse I get, particularly even with trans people. I think it's, I think it's a kind of misogyny, actually. Um, you never really know. I mean, this is the this is the issue, isn't it, with Twitter and everybody being anonymous? So it probably is worse on the left, just in terms because because there's a line, there's an orthodoxy, and the Labour Party had made it clear what that line was. So you publish the piece, you get this huge kind of counter reaction, and at that point you think story's, story's over, over. Mm -hmm. but it's not. Yeah, I, of course, you know, I mean, I, I'm a columnist, some columns get a lot of reaction, yeah, and sometimes you push a button and you think, okay, well, you know, that was a good week to do that because that's something that everybody's talking about and it's just the way it is. Yeah, so yeah, I did think story's over, and the next thing I know, um, is because I never go to the Guardian, I, I don't work there, um, I'm not star, I'm freelance, um, is that there's been this horrible incident in, in daily conference where a trans person, a trans woman, who had apparently already resigned some weeks earlier, got very upset and resigned again in conference and I think said uh, she felt unsafe. She felt you having written that column I, made her feel... I can't, because I wasn't there, I can't say exactly what she said, but I think the gist of it was if The Guardian was publishing this sort of, what, she, what was deemed transphobic that I had written, that she did not feel safe working there. So she resigned, but she had already resigned. So she obviously wanted to make a statement. She made the statement. I think people in the meeting found it very, very upsetting. I think it was horrible. And Hadley, Freeman... Uh, defended me. Uh, I think Claire Phipps, I think a couple of people did. I think most people were just kind of shocked. I think it was, a, yeah, it sounds like not a nice thing. That happened and I heard about that. I mean, can we just pause on that for one sec? What does it mean, this whole unsafe <laughs> thing? Because that, <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't have been the first person to no. use that line. How did, how did it happen that we, we now have people saying they feel unsafe because of an article having yeah. been printed? Well, that's a really interesting question because I think you do actually have to listen to people when they say they feel unsafe. Um, I, I would say when women say, you know, you know, the whole Me Too movement has been often women say, I never really felt safe around that guy. So I would, I would say we must listen to it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't dismiss it, but I think I'm talking more about behaviour actually than written words. I mean, if, if I, you know, didn't read or listen to music or watch films that had content that was, I mean, I, just culturally speaking, a lot of my favourite authors or my favourite films have things that in fact are extremely unsafe to watch as a, as a woman, you know. I don't, I, I don't want this sanitised culture. Uh, because it's a sort of way of making it out that you've been violent. Violent, or exactly. And it's to also, them. yes. And it's also, I mean, I could say I never felt particularly safe at The Guardian because I was working class. And therefore, I didn't fit it. You know, it's like we can use this word. If, if safe just means comfortable, or what does it mean? Does it mean threatened? Or, you know, we can use this word in, in, a di in different ways. But, Certainly, the idea that I've written something that makes someone feel unsafe is not, um, is not, well, do you know what? If I could, I would, because I'd be a witch and I could do spells. I mean, it would be bloody brilliant, wouldn't it, if I could actually write something that made someone feel, I'd, I'd be happy, you know, I, I'd do it tomorrow, you know. I mean, I, I've, got, I've got a list, but... <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, no, I don't think words themselves are unsafe. And someone said to me, actually it turns out to be a wonderful transsexual that I know, famous, uh, um, in the, back in the day, who said to me, you know, this is how book burning starts, word by word. And I thought, this is so true. You, know, you ban that word, and then you ban that word. The next, where, where do you go? There was this big reaction to the column. There was this ugly event inside the daily conference yeah. and then what happened after that and then i was told that a letter had been leaked to buzzfeed and 338 people who worked at the guardian had signed this letter 
and it, the letter was about transphobia um, and the Guardian, the Guardian being a safe space, needing to be a safe space for trans people. And three people had resigned in the last year. Including and, this trans person. Yeah. And that obviously, so I'm not named in the letter, but this is just immediately after this event. So I'm obviously the letter is associated with me. It's leaked by somebody who knows Patrick Strudwick at BuzzFeed and the names are out there. So 338 is a lot of people, even in a relatively big organisation. Yes, it is a lot of people, yeah. So were, were you surprised? You know, what, what do you feel when you see that leaking? Well, obviously when I saw the names, I was really personally upset because some of these people I've worked with and I just thought, why can't anyone just pick up the phone to me or um, write to me or anything? Half, most of them I didn't know who they were or care, to be honest, because, you know, I don't know who, li who works for Guardian Australia and all that. Um, my other reaction was, what kind of journalists do this? Because I've worked in lots of newspapers with lots of people who I fundamentally disagree with, and I've had huge rows with them and sat and beside them the next day and got on. I mean, you, you know, that's to me life. Um, and what is the aim of this letter? Is the aim of this letter to go, yeah, she is such an evil sort of presence at the Guardian, even though she never goes there, she must be got rid of. Um, you know, what, what, what did they want? I think some of the people who signed the letter probably just wanted to say, I'm a nice person and I love all people. And, you know, I like trans people and, I, and, I, and hamsters, you know. It's sort of, you know, sort of just that kind of, if someone put a letter in front of you and said... To show they were virtuous. To show that you're a good person. Except I just don't think journalists should, should do that. I mean, I, wouldn't, I, I don't think journalists should ever sign open letters. I've got a thing about it. I think it's lazy, it's dumb, it's just, no, don't do it. And also, if you're going to sign a letter and you're a journalist, don't think it's going to be kept anonymous and don't think it's not going to cause a reaction. And also ask yourself what it is. I mean, what is, what is the fundamental quality that a journalist needs? Curiosity, right? So what did they think they were doing and what did they want? I can't answer that because I'm not them. But yes, I felt, I felt um, absolutely uh, sort of betrayed, actually. It's betrayed, yeah. Did you talk to any of the signatories of it? Did you ring anyone up and go, what the hell are you doing signing this? I had a few drinks and wrote a very emotional sort of letter to the people I knew about sort of two o'clock in the morning probably didn't even make very much sense but it was obviously indicated that I was upset because I was um, and then that was yeah I, I still you know I still don't I still don't know if some of them do know what they were doing I, I look I can't say so at that point are you then thinking I'm gonna have to leave yeah was that sort of overnight there's no chance I can now stay here for years this is no longer a, a, a welcoming place for me yeah or, oh, well, actually, no, that, that thought, yes. And the second thought is, but this isn't right. And therefore, I will be protected by the management and, and the editors, because that has been my experience in every other newspaper that I've worked for. But that didn't happen? No. I've been the left-wing irritant, for instance, at the Mail on Sunday, and I wrote many things that, the, were, that were against the editorial line. But if anybody complained about me, well, they did complain about me. <laughs> but they had your back. They had my back, yes. That's absolutely the phrase, I think, that you don't have to agree with someone to have their back. Yeah. So you would have liked them to do some kind of gesture to say, yeah. well, what would you have liked to see? I knew it was going to be discussed at the Scott Trust, which runs The Guardian. I wanted uh, an assertion of editorial independence. I wanted uh, people to know that they could not do that to journalists. I wondered why, given what, some, given what has been published in The Guardian previously, why I was the worst thing that ever happened. I mean, we're talking about that great saviour of the left, you know, someone like Seamus Milne 
publishing a sermon by Osama bin Laden. No one wrote a letter about that. You know, like, like quite why was this the worst thing ever? Partly because people haven't got any sense of, haven't got a memory or no history or whatever. I wanted people to know that you, you, you can't behave like this when you disagree with someone because I thought, well, if, if it's not, if it wasn't me, it would be the next person. You know, this isn't a good way to be. Also, it's one of the most famous newspapers in the world. Yeah. It needs to be a And place if you're for... going to say you're a liberal newspaper that encourages a range of views, you know, just stand up for your journalist. Just do it. Just one. And all of it, it would have taken one, one, one statement. So why didn't they do that, do you think? <laughs> because the other big thing that was happening was absolute support pouring in for me from all their big writers, from all sorts of people who could see that this was not good. So I didn't feel all alone, do you know what I mean? I felt like there's this massive support, but no one can sort of put it together and it's not in public. In public, I've got tra I've been trashed um, and therefore it's up to the editor or the management or the Scott Trust, I don't know exactly how it all works, to say, we stand by. Um, you know, this particular writer. We don't agree with her. Never, ever have I asked for anyone to agree with me. I'm a, co I'm a columnist, you know. But, but we stand by her. That's it. And that didn't happen. What happened was Kath took me out to a lunch that I said I didn't want because I didn't. I didn't want to Just speak. Just the two of you? Yeah. I mean, I, the managing editor said I, I said, I don't, I said, I don't want a lunch. Because, I, you know, I feel it's like being, you know, patted on the head and given like a chicken nugget. You know, no, I don't want the lunch. I went. Because they weren't there for you publicly, so they yeah. don't pretend that you're, they're being all friendly privately. Yeah. The reason this is important and so much broader than just your particular example is that people have been talking about so-called institutional capture and, you know, yes. there's yes. been this sort of um, warning signs about certain so-called woke ideologies that have spilt out of university campuses and a lot, often the message back is you guys are being paranoid about this you know you're, you're exaggerating it either because you have some sort of conservative agenda and so you want to demonize the left or whatever but what you're telling is a is a real life story of an institution that has been captured parts of it i think yes but uh, parts of it definitely and also because uh, <laughs> parts of the Guardian have been captured <laughs> parts of really the public sector the BBC all of it um, that I get emails every single day and I'm really not exaggerating from people who are teachers doctors social workers therapists telling me that they're scared of losing their jobs because they're not, they're, again, they have got not nothing, they are the most liberal people, they have nothing against trans people, they want trans people to have good lives, but they just can't go along with the idea that if a little boy wants to put on a dress, they got, they've got to be taken to a clinic and, you know, all of that. Uh, the, other, the, other, the other part of the capture, as a journalist, that I feel very bad about for The Guardian is all these stories that we now know about mermaids and the funding, about Stonewall and the lobbying, about who funds who, um, we haven't investigated. And the Tavistock. And a few years ago, I did, a two, I did two years training um, as a therapist myself, I was interested. And um, of course, my tutors, everybody knew. It's been going on since uh, 2005. The Tavistock is a small institution that deals a lot with gender d dysphoria. People there, extremely qualified and well trained and respected, and the staff turnover has been absolutely massive for a small institution. So you should start thinking, why? And it's because, you know, there's been whistleblowers. Um, uh, there's been um, huge unhappiness about who who transitions and how and how young and what the repercussions of that are. So these are people who are, you, you think are leaving because they've been shocked at what they've seen? Well, yes, they have. You know, I mean, the Guardian, I'm not here to slag off 
the whole Guardian. I mean, look at they've done, look at something like Windrush that Amelia Gentleman did. Absolutely fantastic investigation. Took years. Brilliant, you know, brilliant. Exactly what the Guardian should be doing. But who has investigated uh, Tavistock? You know, the Times have done stuff. The Telegraph have done stuff. Private Eye, The Spectator. My argument to my newspaper, and I do consider myself on the left, whether anyone else will now, I don't know, but is that if, if, you do, if we do not have this debate because we're scared, the right will have it. And, you, and that's what's happened. You know, that is what's happened. So, like, don't, don't, I mean, Christopher Hitchens said, uh, you know, we can all have our different views on Christopher Hitchens says, but if, if you're too scared to write about something, you shouldn't be a journalist. So do you think that's what it is then? You don't think that it's a kind of moral blind spot um, and that they actually think it's sort of dangerous and improper to investigate this because it will, you know, cause too much upset to too many people. Mm. Do you think it's actually that they're scared of the repercussions from this very vocal group? I think, it, I think, I think it's um, a really um, a mixture of things and different influences that within a big organisation. I think for some people, it is simply a belief system uh, that trans people are the most marginalised people on the planet and anyone who says otherwise is probably like a, a murderer, like me. Um, they quote you continually statistics that come from America, and if you tell them that's not, <laughs> these are, you know, for instance, you know, all these te all these people are killed in Brazil or something, and you think, oh my God, how awful! What terrible, awful, risky lives these people have. That's awful. But actually, maybe one trans person a year has been killed here in the last sort of ten years. Three point five women a week have been being killed during COVID. So, like, let's have a sense of proportion about who is affected and who we are setting out to protect here um, is one thing I'd say. But, but you asked me w what the nervousness is around investigation. Um, I think some of it comes from the relationship between the... Um, different parts of the Guardian and Guardian America is full on with one's agenda. So you think it's actually partly inherited from America? And, and big donors. donors in America. The Guardian also take money from something called the Open Society, which also has uh, a certain agenda. I guess like you would expect the Guardian to want to keep its Labour Party readers. Um, so when the Labour Party decided that transphobia was like something that you know you could be thrown out of the party for I suppose I, I mean I've never I've never had this conversation with anyone at the Guardian but I guess there's a bit of that too you know although that didn't work out so well for the Labour Party <laughs> at the last election <laughs> Sorry, no it didn't work out at all did it but I mean it's like who 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 would could have predicted that you know in Bolton that wasn't the number one issue I mean, you know, but it's a bit like who you listen to, isn't it? It's, it's a bit like I see, I see it connected. I see it connected to the anti-Semitism issue in that if, if, if you have a group of people saying to you, if you have sort of Jewish people saying, I don't really feel safe in this Labour Party right now. I feel like there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you, you, you may be saying, well, let's listen to that and tell me about it. If you have a lot of women saying, I don't like the fact that uh, the women's officer is a 19-year-old person who's only just transitioned. I think you listen to that too. You know, I, it, it's a case of dogma versus just listening to people's experiences. Just to, to kind of finish on the, the trans issue then, I mean, you actually feel that it's dangerous for women to take this kind of agenda too far because it sort of delegitimizes women's experience as a distinct thing or, or what no what do you feel like the, the threat is i feel no threat from from any trans person and i never have and i never would and i have never been unkind and trans people have looked after me in my life you know it's my issue isn't really about trans people themselves it is about 
the erasure and capture of language and ideology. And the, uh, if we now have a situation where women cannot, women are now cervix havers or menstruators, and we can't say the word women because it's offensive to a small minority of people. I think that's part of the backlash that's happening towards feminism. I think language is really, really important. I'm not, I'm, I'm actually for political correctness because I think political, p political correctness is just good manners. You know, if you tell me how you want to be, what you want to be called, I will call you that. I think that's just like manners. But for instance, with the trans cis thing, I always thought that was a very strange thing to do because nobody was really consulted. You know, you say, hello, look at us, we're so radical, we're getting rid of the binary. The binary. Oh, here's a new binary, and you, women, you're now cis. And it's like, hang on, no one really asked us about this, and you're just inserting another binary. So there's lots of, I have lots of issues uh, around um, the ability of, and the power, a lot of, there's a lot of power for women and to name their experiences. And it's taken a long time. I mean, when I was young, it was really, really difficult for girls to talk about periods. Or, and now it's better. It's not great, but it's better. You know, people can say that word. And it's, it's really uh, how we give birth, what choices we have when we give birth, how we talk about you know, menopause, you know, these, these female experiences. And it's not, as I say, it's not great, but we can be more open about it. But we cannot be open about these things and make these things better for people if we are told that actually the word wo women is somehow excluding other people. You render language meaningless when you cannot say what it is. And one of these sort of basic insights of feminism, you know, is that is about naming the ability to name your experience and, and then you can own it even though you don't think it's a you, know, you don't feel it's a threat to you but it is a threat to feminism it's to a threat to feminism and it, and it like turns this. out to be a threat to people's employment because i know people who've lost their jobs over this i mean i can get another job i'm very lucky i'm very very lucky a lot of people couldn't get another job. Um, I know people who've lost their jobs. I know people who've been no platformed. I know many academics who just have stopped their courses. I mean, I know a lesbian woman who, for many years, has taught gender studies who just says, "No, I, I can't do that anymore." It's just you know the hassle you get. It's too, and they, <laughs> these people are co completely the opposite of uh, any kind of horrible right-wing you know bigots they're, they're they're on the left they're feminists they can't they can no longer speak but the <laughs> the other you know, the other big thing which i have written about is why are feminists blamed for what's happening to trans people because who murders and rapes trans people is it is it feminists no so like that's the other bit of the not naming no it isn't feminist is it it's men it's mas it's masculine power it's violence same old same old what so what's going on here and i mean i don't know if you saw freddie but you know when jk rowling wrote her essay did you see the levels of abuse the jk rowling thing is obviously relevant to this and I just wonder, do you feel like actually the tide is turning a little bit? I mean, because someone like J.K. Rowling and now yourself, and there are yeah. lots of kind of liberals in America who have yeah. now, do you feel like there is a bit of a line in the sand being drawn and that that faction is, if anything, in retreat? Just lately, I have felt it. And even since I resigned, I have felt that people were kind of waiting to, for someone to um, stand up to it, yeah. I I think a bit. I think I it'll be. I don't know yet how it's going to play out, but I think that many women have felt 
like, is it me? I just, I can't go along with this. Is it me? And once people stand up to it, um, and yeah, I think they feel that enough is enough. Yeah, and again, it's got nothing to do with trying to prevent um, the you know the small percentage of trans people who want to transition being able to tra to transition. But it is we we should be able to ask some questions about um, children. I think to, in particular, I mean, I think it's absolutely the right of anyone over eighteen to do what they want with their bodies. Uh, but I think when we're talking about teenagers and young people um it it's ethically a you know really really difficult situation and the fact that you know the fact that um mermaids is sort of oh, we don't hear much about them anymore all the celebrities support oh they all deleted their tweets it's because people did start to investigate what was going on so let's go back um, in time a bit, you you actually you did a first stint at the Guardian in the nineties. That's right. And then you went independent, Mail on Sunday, and then you came back to the Guardian. Were the seeds of all of this already sown back then? Do you think? I don't think so. I don't really know. Um, I can only say that when I first went to the Guardian, um, I did not fit in then because it was so Oxbridge, um, because I was a woman and. There were no women on the comment pages. You went out for lunch with Peter Preston, <laughs> the then editor. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I won um, columnist of the year, so I suppose he felt he had to take me out to lunch. I don't, I don't, I don't think he wanted to. Um, I, mean, I don't think any of them really wanted. Well, I know they didn't. They, it wasn't that they just didn't want to speak to me. They just didn't know how. I mean, they just used to yell the names of these different Oxbridge colleges at me, and I just go. No, no. And they just, they just still keep doing it. It was weird. It's like, what? I've said I didn't go there. <laughs> it's, just, it's like, you know, what is it? The bat signal. I mean, I, I might as well have been a bat or something. And anyway, um, Peter Preston took me out for lunch and I had found out just, I'd won columns for the year and that was great. You know, very happy about that. And then I had found out like the day after that I was literally on half the pay of the guys that I was working with and decided I should have a pay rise but I didn't have any clue I mean I was young I didn't have a clue people said ask him for some more money and it's like well how I thought you know what is the middle class code of saying can I have more money like how do they do it I don't know how they do it how did you do it <laughs> well I just waited like well what he was a man who didn't speak a lot anyway. So in one of the pauses in the conversation, I just said, can I have more money? I just blurted it out like that. Because he said, is there anything I can do to make you happier? And I said, give me money. And that, and that was that. But it worked? Did he... no. no, because he just called for the bill and I was dismissed. <laughs> so that didn't work, no. And then um, that's when I just thought, I can't deal with it. Yeah, I just can't deal with these people, you know. Um, I don't know what to do. So I got this agent and she was like super agent. And um, she seemed to be able to really scare them. Uh, fantastic. Tiny little, tiny little skirt, BMW keys rattling. And that's the only time you ever phoned me. You just phoned me and said, Suzanne, can you promise me that I never have to see that woman again? <laughs> And then I got a pay rise. So this is back in the 90s. <laughs> so that's in the 90s. But what's kind of interesting is that at that point, you're the kind of anti-establishment figure who is fighting against the what would now be called the patriarchy. Uh, oh, we, called it, now, we called it that then. <laughs> and now this, this time, you know, there's this new generation of people who are kind of implying that you are part of a yeah, sort of old-fashioned yeah, 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 yeah. establishment that needs to be ousted. That's right. Yeah. And, and there's, there's sort of bits of truth and bits of not truth in that, isn't there, I think. I think that, that um, I think for the people who want to ask me now don't kind of quite understand how difficult it was for women of my generation and how we will fight to protect our rights because they're still contested. Um, we didn't have equal pay. We didn't get maternity leave. Do you know what I mean? So I think that they don't sort of... So you th almost think they take for granted yeah. the things that you fought for? In a, in a way, yeah. but I'm very, very sort of loath to do the whole generational divide thing because um, 
I think there are generational divides. And I mean, I had a, I've got, you know, like my life's like a sort of sociological experiment. I had a child in my twenties, one in my thirties, one in my forties. So I've, I've, I, I, I've always lived in a house full of young people who think different things and think different things to me. And, I, and the idea that this generation thinks that and there's this other one over there and never the twain shall meet, I just don't think that's true. I think that on an issue like this, the majority of young people are absolutely uh, liberal on gay rights, trans issues and, and, all, of, and, uh, and all of those things. Actually, I think most people are pretty liberal, but it's just when you get to the point of, but hang on a minute, did, did you, do you really think that this person should be in prison with those women? Or do you think that women's sports can really handle a six foot six per person? You know, so when you get down to these really kind of quite essential questions of fairness, um, then people go, oh, no, oh, no, I don't, I, I don't think that's quite right. What people will no doubt say now mm -hmm. is that, you know, you've become a right winger, basically. You know, you, that you already did a time at the Mail on Sunday, so you probably were damaged goods ever since then. And now, well, they've you said know, that all now, the time. They've already, wherever yeah, they you already go next, yeah, of course. it's not going to be The Guardian. And therefore, how do you respond to that? Do you think you have become more right wing? No, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> I mean, actually, no. I mean, if that, I, I think the left um, and the right and how they're defined has changed is one thing. Uh, certainly, I did not like Corbyn. One of the reasons I never liked Corbyn is because I came, my first job, I worked, I was an editor at Marxism Today. I have been around enough of the hard left to know people like Corbyn and to know and to reject very much what they stand for. I mean, how do you show you're not right wing? I mean, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anything. You don't I'm, vote Tory, for example, isn't that a... Uh... <laughs> I'd rather boil my own head than vote Tory. I mean, you know, that's just, that, that's just never, ever going to happen. But I, but I don't vote Labour. I haven't voted Labour for many years. If you ask me if I, you know, no, I'm not right wing, but I would tend to be libertarian. I would always go for freedom of speech. Yes. And so that puts me like that puts me on, on a different side to people who want to know platform uh, and all of that. Um, I, I think the answer to hate speech is always going to be more speech. I think the answer to a bad column is a, is a good column. You know, I, I want I think the answer to bad art is make more art. You know, I'm not. You don't like shutting stuff down. I really don't like shutting stuff down because because history tells us who gets shut down. You know, like a, a minute, the the we know who gets shut down like right away. It, it's not it's not you know no one's going to sort of make a, a a raid on on the establishment. It'll be some sort of poor little artists. Do you know what I mean? It's never the weak people end up. It's the losing. weak people, and 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 the idea that you can bring down the powerful with this stuff. No, 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 you can't. Um, so I think what we're seeing is is this is this tussle between these different kinds of ideas, and what will happen, and is happening, is a fragmentation, which. I feel like quite sad about because it, 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 in terms of my own politics, for instance, you know, I came after the AIDS crisis. I'd lived in the States. Uh, of course, I was involved in a lot of AIDS activism. And the gay men that I was marching alongside would then march alongside me if I was went to a, a rally for abortion rights. We considered ourselves on the same side. And we were on the same side, you know, and the idea that that's really all fragmented and everyone's in their own little, well, I've dyed my fringe blue and therefore I'm polyamorous. And you just think, please, I mean, or. So you think you, you lose the sense of solidarity with so think, much? Yes, actually, that's a really, that's a really good word, because that was one of the shocks about that letter to me, was this absolute lack of solidarity, not with my beliefs, because that's everyone's choice but with you 
a journalistic solidarity. I would defend somebody on another newspaper. And in fact, I was defended in every other newspaper. Now, OK, I get it. Some of it was just to attack The Guardian. But also some of it is just to say, look, come on, you know, let, let people, let her write what she wants to write. You don't have to like it. So solidarity, yeah. How are we going to make sol solidarity b b between people who absolutely believe that um, any kind of debate is, is literal violence? And people like me who say, no, <laughs> we are going to carry on saying the things you don't like. I mean, do you think you could make a accommodation with, you know, Owen Jones, Ash Sarkar, could, yeah. could there be a, yeah. a beautiful um, <laughs> reconciliation? I don't think there's going to be a reconciliation at all, but I think you can, you can stand beside someone and disagree with them, yeah. I don't think it has to be, um, you know, you're the most evil person in the world because you think different things. No, I think that you know, there's things I like. For instance, I like, as much as I disagree with lots of it, I like something like Navarra Media. I like something like this. I like these new forms of alternative media. I do. I love it because to me it's quite punk. So I like it. I like the fact there's new things coming. I don't, I, I like new radio stations. I, this, this energy to me is good and it will come in different places. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel threatened by that at all. I think that's great. Again, I don't have to agree with it, but I like it. Do you feel liberated in some way that, you know, you don't need to apologise for anything? You might have noticed even when I was younger, <laughs> I didn't really care that much anyway. And as I've got older, there's less and less. I mean, uh, yes, I find, I find ageing quite liberating in certain ways, definitely, yes. I mean, I've, ha I've had my kids, um, I've had a life and... I do, do, I do realise that I should sort of crawl under a rock and, you know, go away. But I'm just not going to do that. And I don't think my generation of women are going to do that. And, um, and now you've been through this year, uh, do you feel you're even stronger? They've thrown 338 rocks at you. <laughs> well, if Next you time that me, happens, you, you put my, you, you care even less. Yeah, I mean, I think earlier in the year when I was really upset about it, I probably did want to crawl under a rock. And then when I got the support and then also actually deciding to leave is, I mean, I think it's just, yeah, you, you've, got to, you've got to walk it like you talk it. And if, if you say, you know, I'm not putting up with this crap anymore, um, and then you leave, it's an incredibly good feeling and I and I realized it took me a long time to it took me a few months really to think do you know what this is bullying and do you know what this is a, an abusive workplace and and I don't want to be here and it because I didn't nobody likes to see them see themselves as a victim or someone who's been bullied I don't I certainly didn't want to see myself like that but once I felt that um emotionally but do you feel like the, this kind of take no prisoners attitude is going to be strengthened from now on. That like, am I going to tone it down? No. Are you going to tone it up? <laughs> no, I don't want to be. I don't want to just upset people or be offensive for the sake of it. I'm not interested in that. What I've been pleasantly surprised by is that when you do say it how it is, as much as it upsets some people, there's just a whole load of other people out there going, "Oh yes, go on, go for it." Just say it, you know. So there's a kind of relief in it, you know, of, oh, God, I've been thinking that, and now she's said it. So um, if you can do that, as long as I can do that, um, that's I'm happy. But my argument is always been, and my politics have always been, and my mission is to centre women um, in, in, in the experience, in, our experiences in what I write and if that upsets whoever it upsets well I'm going to carry on doing it. Suzanne thank you very much that was Suzanne Moore um, who has just left the Guardian telling us about her experiences there um, and we look forward to seeing where she crops up her whole account is available on Unheard from today have a look and check it out.